Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Cook, and I'm the program's librarian here at the Rancho Mirage Public Library. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the library today. Uh, we want to say thank you to our Rancho Mirage Library and um, Observatory Foundation, because that is the organization that makes all these wonderful programs here at the library happen. So thank you to the foundation. Yes. Um, we also have uh, uh, Councilwoman Iris Smotrich here with us today, and she's in the back of the room, so wave to Iris. We're very glad that she came today. And I think we so have some members of the uh, City's Emergency Preparedness Commission here today, and if you're here, thank you very much for coming. Oh, quite a few. Yeah, very good. And then the rest of you, I suppose, are friends of, of Jim's. And <laughs> how many are friends of Jim's? Yeah, very good. Um, well, Jim does a lot to help the community in, in many different ways. And um, primarily for coming today and, and putting on our lecture, uh, cybersecurity in a time when we need tools and techniques to help us secure our online personal and financial security. Uh, Jim is a noted writer and national speaker on the subject of cyber threats um, facing the United States, a former Air Force officer. He spent his 30-year career in uh, computer technology and served as CEO of a high-tech firm in Silicon Valley, which helped move for Fortune 500 class organizations to new computing platforms. He is also the author, I think I saw it on the, the screen before, of the cyber thriller Aftershock, which is um, a, a wonderful book that's in our library collection, and I urge, urge you to read it and um, check it out. So with that, please give Jim a nice, warm Rancho Mirage Library welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Susan. Well, welcome everyone. I hope you're all having a good uh, Friday the 13th. I hope it's treating you well. Um, I'll try not to change that, but uh, for some of you I may. We'll find out. We did this last year, so in a sense we're doing an update, but also in a sense a lot has happened in the last 12 months, the last six months. So I'm going to do my best to bring you up to date on the personal security side of things. And I'm going to look at basically three topics. Uh, the first is just to, for you to understand that we are living in an information age where your information, my information is important. It's valuable. It's every bit as valuable as oil was, oil was in the last century and gold in the century before that. And there are many organizations who will do what they can to get a hold of that information. Second, we have institutions that hold our information. And some of those, like Equifax, we'll talk about them, and the federal government, are supposed to keep that information safe. And they are, as I will point out to you, uh, doing a miserable job of keeping that information safe. Well, let's just, we'll be honest. Now, I'll, I'll give you examples, and I will, I will name names, not uh, hiding anything here. And so you've got the information is valuable. You've got the organizations that are supposed to protect it or not. And what that means is that the responsibility for our personal security online falls to us. And so that's really what this talk comes down to when we get to the third part of it. And that is there's a personal responsibility that all of you either face up to in what is a different era than we grew up in. We did not grow up instinctively doing the things that we have to do today to keep our finances and ourselves secure. The world has changed. So you either accept those changes and take some steps, which I'll point out, or you don't take those steps and you accept the consequences. So you have no complaints if you don't protect yourself. So that's the, that's the things that we're going to look at. 
Make sure this is working. So there are, I couldn't even list all of the forces and the individuals and the organizations who have an interest in our personal and financial information. Here is a partial list. It is an overwhelming list. Each one of them has their own approaches, their own methods, their own motives, and you don't know who will be coming from where. This makes protecting yourself difficult. What are they trying to do? They are stealing money, stealing your identity, it's tax fraud, scams. All of you, I'm sure your inboxes are filled with scams, intellectual property. China has, for the last 10 years, stolen more intellectual property, trade secrets, military weapons plans from the United States than is conceivable. I have a map, I'm not showing it today, but I showed it two weeks ago and we were talking about national security. Of the known Chinese intrusions for intellectual property theft in the last five years, showed a map of the United States. Did some of you see this? And every place there was an intrusion, when there was a theft, there was a red dot. There were over 500 red dots. China has been doing this over and over and over again. And so we are either unable or unwilling to stop them. Take your pick, and, and your pick depends on how you read this, the circumstances. And then the last one, we hear talk about information warfare. We were watching the other night, Homeland, anybody watch Homeland? And, uh, you know, boom, boom, information warfare. So they've got to stay current on things. So what happens is we have data breaches. This information is leaving these organizations. These are just a small fraction of some of the, the major ones that have happened. You know, recently, some of the more recent ones is Delta Airlines. You'd think they would have their system secure, you know, because they're keeping their planes in the air. Uh, they are not secure. IRS should have our information secure, but it's not. Uh, Ritz-Carlton, Uber, et cetera. You go down the list. So the organizations are large. They are varied, and they, uh, uh, they're all vulnerable. Now, Equifax is the credit rating bureau. I think you all know this that last September it was announced that they had lost the personal information on about 150 million Americans, which is just about all the adults. But certainly everybody in this room, all of your personal identifying information, and that means social security number, date of birth, driver's license information, anything personal, uh, they coughed that up. They coughed it up. And we'll talk in a minute about how, how that could have happened. But this changes everything. The reason this changes everything is we have spent, I've been doing these talks now <laughs> longer than I care to remember, but seven years I think we're going on. And there's, we've had a lot of emphasis and focus on how do we protect our social security number, our basic Information. Well, you no longer have to worry about protecting it because it is gone. It has been taken. So, so you just don't have to worry about it. I think I feel I sleep a lot better at night knowing that the criminals have it because the criminals hopefully are more secure than uh, our government, certainly Equifax, but they, they changed it. So last year there were, I don't know how they count these things. There are 2.9 billion records stolen in 2017. Um, that's a lot of records, a lot of personal records. And so the pipes are just like open. The question comes down to how can this happen? These are major organizations. You saw a list of some of them. They're, they're, they're major. They have tremendous budgets for cybersecurity. They are all aware that there's a problem. I mean, this goes back, uh, one of the first big ones was Target, if you remember that, losing all the point of sale information on your credit and debit cards. So it's not like it's a secret that there's a problem, okay? So uh, how do we explain it? And, and all I can say, there, there is a combination out there with the corporations 
and to government agencies of uh, somehow not being able, they don't have their act together. That's, that's one group. There's another group that I'm convinced really don't care. And there's another group that finds protecting our information is at odds with their business model. So, we'll talk about all three of those, but that's why it's happening. Now, there was a conference, this one just got, virtually got over. Every year, the Wall Street Journal puts on a chief, chief information, CIO, chief information officer conference. So these are, the, these are the men and women in these major organizations who are primarily responsible for ensuring the security of the information in the organization whatever that organization's key information is, financial, personal, whatever. So you would think they know something about securing that data. The Wall Street Journal ran a special section once this conference was over this year, and the headline was, it was a lead in, companies are learning just how vulnerable their operations really are. And the statement, that is a quote, they are just learning. And you say, this has been going on way too long. And yet there's organizations that are saying, boy, I guess we better get serious about this. Another case, the World Economic Forum takes place every January, February in Davos, Switzerland. They have the elite of the elite in terms of businesses, governments, and uh, you name it. And they every year come up with a list of what are the major threats facing the world. Global view. This year, their number one, number three threat, their number one threat, I mean, this is Davos, number one threat is climate change. Okay, so three is cyber attacks. So they're saying at Davos to all of their organizations, this is a serious problem going forward. Now, what came out of that was uh, Zurich Institute in Insurance, excuse me, does a study for the World Forum that creates this list. And one of their conclusions was from this report that led to the ranking number three, was that it is time to wake up to the risks of cybercrime. So I think you're starting to get the gist here that there's some cluelessness going on out there that explains part of why some of these organizations are not doing their jobs. Now we get to Equifax. Equifax was audited and warned three years in a row that they were not protecting their Per the information that they use to run their business. Now, what do they use to run their business? Their business is using our personal and financial information to extend information to those who want to give you credit. That's primarily, there's more to it. So you would think that they would look at our information as being something they really want to protect. Three years in a row, they had warnings that they did not heed. The last one was the one that yielded them to cough up the 150 million. Now, there are consequences. They lost their CEO. They lost some of their CIO type people. And there are lawsuits still being filed. There's just one filed yesterday by the state of Virginia that seeks huge damages from Equifax. So they're gonna be litigating this for years. In fact, speaking of litigating, Target had over 110 suits, and they are still litigating. They will be litigating for years. So the costs of coming out of, of this type of attack are, are serious. So Equifax obviously didn't care too much. LifeLock, everybody know who LifeLock is? What do they do for business? What do they do? Oh, they protect. Okay, so. Yeah, the, uh, LifeLock it runs a lot of ads. Uh, spend a lot of money on advertising. So LifeLock is basically going to warn us if someone trying to access your information or, or get to it, or maybe they actually have. So their business, again, is managing our information that we give them. Also for three years in a row, the Federal Trade Commission 
conducts audits of organizations like LifeLock, and three years in a row told them that their, their methods to secure our information were inadequate, wholly inadequate. They did not fix it. So in July of 2015, I believe is the right year, the FTC said, that's enough. You're coughing up a hundred million dollar fine. The fact that you are endangering your client's information because they are not protecting the information that we give them to protect us with. You, run, you see how circular that is? Makes absolutely no sense. Hundred million dollars. Their stock, when this hit, they were an independent company, their stock dropped 50% in 32 minutes. A chart is appalling. It's just like this, and then it's, the bottom fell out. From 8 to 16. Now, turns out they could not or did not choose to survive as an independent firm. They too had lawsuits. So they sold out to a company called Symantec, which has antivirus software primarily, um, and still operate under their name, but they are now part of a larger organization. So that is how they survived, and that, is their, that was their level of care, which was not very much. Now, there have been a lot of hearings this week. Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, has been in Washington Tuesday, Wednesday. Some of you may have seen some of these hearings with him testifying, and uh, I was talking with one of the gentlemen beforehand. He asked me if I was going to mention this, and I said, uh, I do not have enough time up here to express my anger about what went on. But I will just tell you a little bit, just a little bit, because we, we are limited on time, and if there's questions about this, I'll be happy to take it. Uh, but we all know who, who Facebook is, and uh, probably everybody here uses it. What a lot of people don't know is the extent to which Facebook monitors our lives. Okay? And I think the, the normal wisdom, if you just talk to normal people on the street, they think that, well, we're going to give them some personal information, you know, who we are, birth date, etc., maybe. And then we're going to have this, this information flow back and forth with our friends, relatives, loved ones, right? Pictures, videos. Hi, I was just here. That's pretty innocent stuff. Well, that's really not what they're doing, okay? Uh, when you sign up, if you go through their 297 pages of disclaimers and sign that, uh, <laughs> you are agreeing to a whole bunch of things. So this is, a, again, a partial list. I, 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 if I make that list any longer, the type will be small and no one can read it. Uh, so they are monitoring all of your devices. So I left my cell phone uh, somewhere else right now. Uh, they are monitoring other apps that you go to that are not, have nothing to do with Facebook. They are monitoring your offline activity when you're not logged in. Your websites that you visit. You go to Amazon and you do an inquiry because you're looking for a nice pair of shoes. That information gets to Facebook. Okay? Anybody you go to, that information gets. The physical location, so this doesn't bother some people. I was just talking to my wife about this on the way over. She says it doesn't bother her if, if uh, her location is monitored. She's honest. I said, no, but it's kind of the larger basket of, of uh, things that are going on. Uh, phone call logs. If you have an Android phone, phone call logs. What numbers did you talk to, when, for how long? Online activity, who's, who's in your inbox, who's in your contact list. That wasn't what we signed up for. That wasn't what we signed up for. But it's all there and it's all legal. And so, I'll just say two sentences about this and I'll move on because, I, like I say, I get very frustrated. The, the level of knowledge of our senators and congressmen, bless their hearts, their level of knowledge about this, they grew up in a different generation, okay? They, they are digital immigrants, just like we're immigrants. We're not natives. Mark Zuckerberg is a digital native. He grew up with this stuff. He knows it. It's, it's part of his DNA, all right? So it's hard for the senators and congressmen and women to ask intelligent questions because they have no idea how Facebook works. 
And Mr. Zuckerberg did an absolutely brilliant job of hiding how it works. Brilliant. And he still maintained in day two that the user is in control of where your information goes. Okay? I mean, you pick who it's going to. What else do you want? Well, what else do you want is it goes to a lot of other places. And then there are also organizations who can buy access to that information. The one that came up a lot was this Cambridge Analytica in England that had gained access to, what they say, 87 million information, 87 million of us, and used that and parsed it and did all kinds of things with it. We didn't, we didn't authorize that. You didn't authorize that. But the real story behind how Facebook works did not come out in these hearings. And I think the, uh, <laughs> hopefully there will be a, uh, some backlash to uh, Mr. Zuckerberg so we can start thinking about changing things when the, the uh, Congress figures out that they were duped, you know, basically duped, and, and in some cases lied to, absolutely misrepresented what uh, Facebook does. So this is dangerous, uh, and it goes a long way towards shattering whatever we thought we had in terms of personal and privacy. So here, we're saying that privacy is shattered. Why? Well, you have the breach data that comes from the Equifaxes and the the LinkedIn's and all those organizations. You have the government data, Office of Personnel Management, OPM, if you were served in the government or in the military in the past 28 years, all of your per personnel records, including your top secret clearance information, if you've been through that, you know how extensive that is. All of that is in China. So when you apply for a visa to visit China, they already know exactly who you are. Okay, and if you need to be watched, I don't get paranoid here, but it's a little uncomfortable knowing that that information is gone. Now, what was our response? Our response was the Office of Personnel Management, uh, once again, had ignored the Inspector General, had not updated their systems, had not protected that information. And so when, the, when this news broke, and of course there were hearings, there were always hearings in Congress, I mean, uh, uh, that seems to be the major part of what they do, General James Clapper, who at that time was the Director of National Intelligence, as you may remember, was asked about this, and he said, this isn't a quote, but this is as close as I can remember, all right, said, I have to hand it to the Chinese on this. I would have done the same thing to them if I could. On television. Hand it to them. So, what were the repercussions to China? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Healthcare information? Okay, healthcare providers, when you go to the, if, particularly if you're going to check in for some type of procedure or an operation, you give the hospital, you give the, everybody a lot of personal information next to Ken, where you live, where you grew up, all your credit card information, your social security, the list is long, right? You've been through it, it's a lot of forms. Okay, uh, that information is also vulnerable and is, is stolen quite routinely. Uh, we talked about the social media postings and we've talked about the other non-social media data. So you add all that together, that is your profile and that is the profile that goes on the dark web, which is the colloquial term for that section of the internet where the criminals, spies, and generally the bad people do their business, all right? So your information profile, you can throw the Chinese stuff in there too if you want, is all available for sale. All of it. And that's why I said Equifax kind of finished it all off. If there were any missing elements, they are now no longer missing. So there's your profile. It goes to the dark web. There's all kinds of organizations that distribute that. This is a huge business. I mean, cybercrime is uh, trillions. It, it's huge. And so they put these on sites, and you can look it up. They had an example today on, on the news about something having to do with opioid use and tracking it down on the dark web, trying to figure out where these guys are, which you can't because they're doing it anonymously. So they, they sell your information. They sell cyber attack methods. They sell drugs, 
prostitution, human trafficking, all of that goes on the dark web. I don't know how anyone would know this, but the estimate is that the dark web is, is nine to ten times larger than the web that we access. Because you can't access the dark web by putting it in Google. You have to go through, you have to go through a certain specific portal, and you can do it. But when you get there, you don't want to be there. It's ugly. Uh, so uh, your information then is sold and it's spread. So what happens if your profile works this way? It's not like a criminal buys your information and launches an attack. Many criminals have access to that information. And so you can, have, you can be attacked multiple times. There was a local business, for example, that had a ransomware attack. Their systems were frozen. They had to pay the ransomware to get their, their, system, their information available. Basically, the doors were closed as long as this went on. And so they did whatever they did, paid them off, fixed it, I don't know which. No one likes to say. And uh, a couple of months later, they were hit again. Okay, so it's, it's just different groups that will come after you. So all of this works on the dark web, and here's, here's really what happens. It, it is uh, available, and it's almost as available as you can see on this this cartoon for the, for the taking. So what happens is that there's a tremendous amount of personal information that leads to identity uh, loss um, taking place, 48,000 every day. That's a lot of Americans having their identity taken. So what it's come down to, me netting this out, is we are sitting ducks. That's us with the bullseye. And then the question becomes, well, what do we do? And I'll go back to the point I made at the beginning, and that is that we are about as safe as our ancestors were during the days of the Western frontier in the 1860s and 70s. In other words, you just were as secure as you were lucky or perhaps could hire someone to protect you. And if you remember, there was a TV show, a really good show, Paladin, Wire Paladin. Okay, in San Francisco, and Paladin would come get your money back, or your sweetheart, or whatever the problem was. The problem with this, Paladin doesn't exist, right? And we can't call him. In fact, if we have our identity stolen, the federal government cannot help us. That's not totally true. They can, they can help you. Uh, you can report it, and uh, they can take you through the steps of getting your identity back, but it really never, it's never really recovered. Uh, local police can't help you. That's not their, not their thing. So um, you have to turn to yourself. So what are the consequences? The consequences, one of them is ransomware. I think this is a generic term. I probably don't need to mention this, but this is where you try to turn on your computer, and you find that your files are encrypted, they are inaccessible, nothing on that information on your system is available. And usually there's a nice announcement, a very nice announcement, that says, hi, your system is unavailable if you will pay up a certain amount. The typical amount for individuals today is running between $2,500 and $3,500. We will give you a key that lets you take the encryption off of your data. And then we'll leave you alone. Till next time. <laughs> so you have two choices. You can pay, or you can get your local IT guy to come in and take a look and say, can you fix this? Well, he can't fix it if you don't have your data backed up because you can't recover because your data is encrypted and it can't disencrypt it. So you're in kind of a bind. So the, the, what I'm going to talk about in a minute is what you want to do the recovery process is painful and it can be expensive. What you want to do is prevent this. Uh, do everything possible to prevent having this come up on your, your computer. Tax fraud, we're at the end of tax season for many, except those who extend. And uh, there's a lot of tax fraud that takes place typically earlier in the year where the criminals have enough of your personal information where they can they can file, you've probably heard about this, they can file a fictitious tax return claiming a nice juicy refund, let's say 30000 sound like a nice number, and they get that $30,000 to them. When you go to file your tax return, 
the IRS says, sorry, you've already filed and you have your refund, so leave us alone. You say, what refund? And now you're in a loop where you have to prove to the IRS that you are who you say you are. Because the, the legitimate you's already filed. So I know people that have taken them one to two years to reestablish with the IRS, their banks, etc., that they are who they are, because the identity has been stolen. And there's all kinds of versions of this, but it happens. I think last year the number I saw tax fraud of this type was 3.9 billion in the United States. That is with a B. It's a lot of money. And the IRS does what it can to police it. But you can file a tax return with very little information. You don't need too much information. You make up all the numbers. They don't, if you file early enough, they have no records to check those numbers against. No W-2s, no interest, no dividend payment. No, none of those records are there in late January. So the criminals can put whatever they want. Financial theft. Uh, it's very possible you could log on to your computer and find that your bank account, which had $12,000 yesterday, has zero today because the criminals took, got access to your, your financial systems. And I know my, I do uh, investing and banking with uh, USAA from my military days. And uh, they, I was talking to them about their latest security procedures. I was complaining about them, actually, recently. And they were saying that they checked that my account had been attempted breaches uh, three times in the last six or seven months. And I can vouch for that because I know I've replaced three credit cards of theirs in that same period of time. Uh, so um, this type of theft can happen. The criminals just keep trying until they get something that works. And if you protected yourself, they're not going to get to you. Identity theft, we've talked about this is probably the most serious thing that can happen to you because all the relationships that you have with organizations that are financial, personal, you have to reestablish who you are, and it is not easy. I know people who have been through it, and it's, uh, you, again, you want to uh, regret it. So it comes down to, here we are, sitting ducks. There's a guy who just came back. I don't see any ducks in his boat there, but uh, what is your plan? Now, there's a couple of things going on here. One is, you could be like this. This man, or at least the way I've always interpreted this image, is that he's taking the wrong step. Would you gather that? He's about to go to his death, and he's emptying out his, his rowboat. So one thing is a lot of people just don't know what to do. So that's why today I'm going to give you five steps that I think will do a, a lot to help you stay secure. Uh, you'll never be 100% secure, I can guarantee you. But I do know a lot of people, including good friends, who believe that they are just going to do nothing and roll the dice. And you may be okay. I, I do want to point out, amidst all of this news about being vulnerable and being a sitting duck, that it really is a matter of your number coming up. Okay? You could go for years and never have a problem. Go for years. But the question is, I mean... Most of, most of you in this room, I mean, you've, you've, you've worked hard for your money, you've saved your money, you've invested your money. The question is, do you want to give it up? And you probably don't, but do you, do you want to not give it up enough to take some steps? That's the question. But I know a lot of people who roll the dice and they're very blasé about their uh, protection. So the first, first thing before we get into the steps that I'm going to recommend to you is, is to just take a good, hard look at yourself in the mirror and say, am I serious about doing something? Or am I going to roll the dice? Because, you know, maybe it'll be okay. Jim says it's, maybe it's okay. I heard him. That's a quote. Um, so it's a question of how much risk you want to take. But you want to take a hard look. And if you feel like you have some exposure that you really don't want to put out there and lose the money that you have for your grandchildren or your next trip to Europe or whatever, you know, that's, that's up to you. So we're going to talk about these five steps. The first one is critical. All right. And this, this has to do, we're going back to the Equ Equifax topic. Okay. There's, there's three primary credit rating bureaus. Okay. And um, they have a facility, as you know, or all of you know, where you can have your credit reports frozen. So if someone attempts to go in, they've stolen your identity, okay? And they go in and they say, 
uh, would like to uh, take a loan to buy this new Ferrari. So the Ferrari dealership checks your credit. Okay, everything looks okay. Papers are signed. It's not you doing this. And off he goes in the new Ferrari. All right, now, if you've had your credit reports frozen, when that individual goes in to file for credit, they don't get, the dealership cannot get a credit report. And, I, oh, and also you might say, well, I buy my Ferraris only with cash. You look like that kind of group, actually. <laughs> only with cash. Um, but even if you go to give them a check, and you're gonna pay cash for the Ferrari, they're gonna check your credit. You never know those che that those funds are really there. So there are, uh, I, I also wanna point out that on these five steps, I, I've seen some people taking notes and God bless you, it's smart. I have, I have uh, summarized these five points on a single sheet. This is a, I don't know if it was a master stroke of intelligent writing or if it was just small type, but it's one or the other. And so that you will have available to you when you leave. It's on a pink sheet by the table as you go out the door. So you don't have to write anything down. All the steps are there. So you just reach for the pink sheet and see which of those things apply to you. Credit freezes are really important. Now you can also say, well, gee, I'd rather not do that because I understand, Jim, if I want to take out a new credit card, I then have to unfreeze those. Yes, you do. Because you can't even get credit because you've had it frozen. And the way you prove you are who you are is they give you, each of the credit bureaus give you a pen. And I actually know of people who don't know where their pen is, as scary as that is. Um, that's a personal problem. So, you can unfreeze it, then you can freeze it again. Those are the three. On the pink sheet, I have the contact information of the websites. I have the telephone numbers, 800 numbers. Call them up. My experience is you can do all three closures or just alerts if you want in about 30 to 35 minutes for all three. And the questions from them are all about the same. The information is on the sheet. Two-factor authentication, I, I, I always do surveys because it's important for me to, to know. Uh, how many of you know what this is? Oh, good, what a group. Maybe I should give you this presentation. Okay, so this, this is, as you know, it's having a secondary device that is an authent extra authentication step for you when you go into your accounts. Now, this is something you should have for all financial accounts, your banks, investment accounts, not all your accounts. My, my Wall Street Journal account, I don't need this, all right? I really don't need it. But for my financial accounts, my banking accounts, um, anything with my accountant, those types of things. You might have four or five that you want to turn this on, and this is on the pink sheet as well. This is absolutely critical because someone then has to be, if it's the phone that you're using as a device to authenticate you, the, that person has to have your phone in their possession. Now Schwab does it a little differently as some organizations do. They give you a little fob. You have some of those from Charles Schwab, a little tiny thing. And it's so small that my wife thinks she's gonna lose it, so she has it on a ring, a duck ring. So there's a duck and then there's a Schwab thing. So everywhere we go, we have to take this, and that's the only way she can access her Schwab account. If she has that, a little code comes on there, you enter that five, six-digit code and get into your Schwab account. Don't have it, no access. Thank you for calling. Number three, passwords are the pathway to trouble. So it's important. Uh, I don't want people to be overwhelmed here because we have a lot of passwords, we have a lot of versions, we have a lot of things that people have said about passwords. And what's really important is to prioritize what are the key accounts again? What are the key things that you want to protect? And make sure those passwords are, are solid, absolutely solid. Not all of them. Like I said, Wall Street Journal, it's very simple. Financial Times, very simple. And I can remember all of those. I can't remember the ones that I use for the other accounts. 
They, um, I say lengthen, and I want to say 12 to 14 characters, and uh, you can gasp if you wish. If you remember some of you who were here last year, we went through it, actually went through a little exercise, a password guessing contest, uh, where it was an uh, elimination contest, where I put up a, you know, some passwords, and you pick which ones you think are the most secure, and then every round, the people who got it right could go to the next, and we got down, there's one person in this room who answered all five questions correctly. Uh, that quiz was based on the standards for passwords based, uh, that was developed by the National Institute of Standards. And those standards say, should have a special character, upper, lower case, a numeric, you know, you're familiar with all these. Okay. Uh, the National Institute of Standards coughed up the truth. And that is, those password rules have been proven to be absolutely ineffective. Now, where did that, where did that come from? Well, it started in the early 2000, 2003, perhaps. And they said, we really need to come up with some standards for passwords because this is going to be an issue. And they said, hey, what are you doing? A guy says, well, I'm on break. This is fine. I want you to come up with some standards for passwords. So he went around, talked to the engineers. The engineers weren't about to give them their passwords to see what they're doing. So he did find a, uh, a research paper that is written in 1986 that espoused this formula, special character, upper, lower, numeric. And that's what became the standard. There was no proof that that worked. There was no proof it was a bad idea. There was no proof of anything. It was just the standard. And he retired recently. I remember seeing an interview of him, and he said he tried his best to come up with something. That's all he could find. So that's what they published. Anyway, our, a lot of organizations ask for that information that way, and you have to provide it. But in reality, the, uh, the truth is, the longer the password, the better. Whatever you put in it. It can be a phrase. I've lived in Sun City for six years. A phrase. It can be an abbreviation of that phrase. It, it, but it needs to be 12, 14 characters or more. So, that is the new thinking. Now, it's hard to remember all of those. And in fact, this is a list of... The, these are the actual... Every year... I forgot I put this in here. This is great. Every year, an organization actually researches the top, the passwords that are used. This is actual passwords that are used, okay? And number one was that. Number two was password. And we laugh, but that's what people are using. And so I stand up here and say you need 12, 14 characters, but you know, it goes right over the head. At any rate, you can see that there's a certain lack of, uh, con uh, people aren't, really aren't concerned. They wouldn't be, wouldn't be doing this. So now you probably remember back to the, 2016 election, and we had uh, Mr. Podesta here had his Yahoo account, I'd say breached. He got a phishing email that says, your account has been compromised. We need you to reset your password for Yahoo, for Yahoo, which he said, I can do that. And he reset it and he picked a new password. Do you know what his password was? You want to guess? One, two, three, four, five. Password. <laughs> so as a result, uh, the Russians or whoever got into the Democratic National Committee and got all those embarrassing emails, communications, and information, put it out there, went to WikiLeaks, uh, had reverberations, uh, supposedly reverberations on the, the election. Um, we're able to get that information because he opened up that system through his silly. So when I say that uh, it, it, it's important, passwords are important, they are. These other things are important as well. So we had some uh, dissatisfied customer there. Another example, Sony Pictures, this goes back uh, three or four years. Sony Pictures had a hack where they were releasing a film. One of the films had to do with the... Uh, assassination of their supreme leader, Mr. Kim. And the uh, North Koreans evidently didn't find that humorous, so they took down the 
computer systems for Sony Pictures and also said, by the way, we're going to release a whole bunch of embarrassing information about what you say about your actors and how much everybody in the organization is paid, which is horribly large amounts. And if you release that film, we cannot guarantee the security and safety of the people who go see it. That's extortion. So the distributors of the film said, no, we really don't want to distribute that film. Or maybe they had seen the film, it was no good, they just didn't want it. But they said, no, we're not going to distribute it. So they did find a few independent distributors that released about 300 copies, uh, 300 theaters, uh, and that was it. Uh, their number one most used password, Sony Pictures. <laughs> I mean, this is what I mean when I'm talking about these institutions. I just like, this defies any belief. Now, they are smart, though. I will give them this. They, they did have some critical systems that they wanted to maintain close access to. Didn't want anybody to get into these. So they had special passwords for these really important systems. And um, unfortunately, they put all those in a folder called passwords. <laughs> and this is all the God's truth. I did not make this up. So, what do you do? How do you deal with Jim's world of 12, 14, 18 character passwords? You get a password manager. There are lots of them. Here are three. And uh, at the basic level, they are free, but you typically want to spend a little bit. So you can just Google password manager reviews and pick one. But uh, you can have them pick your passwords for you. They will generate something that is absolutely unstealable, I can guarantee you. Then all you need to remember is one password. We're back to uh, the credit monitoring. <laughs> and that is the password to get into LastPass or Dashlane. If you don't have that, you don't get in. And so then they automatically re they populate your sites. You know how it works when you go uh, to log in. And uh, protect your passwords. You can keep as com make them as complex or as long, communicate as, uh, as complex as you would like. So critical. Number four is phishing. I've used this term before, and I think everybody knows exactly what we're talking about. This is those emails, communications, special offers, Facebook posts, uh, all kinds of manner of things that happen to get you to click on a link, go to a website, give up information, um, and compromise the information on your, your computer. So uh, this is something that has to be avoided at all, all costs. The primary way that uh, people have that happen is because of, of phishing. The ransomware, ransomware that I talked about earlier, 97% last year of those attacks were a result of, of phishing. In fact, a lot of what we're talking about is a result of simple phishing. You saw John Podesta's you know, situation. So here's just some examples. I won't go through these in detail. But you get something that looks, looks good, you know, Home Depot, um, take the survey. I mean, that looks really innocuous. What's well, nothing wrong with that? But um, and in fact, these, there are a number of different signs, if you pay attention, that would tell you that if you were to click on take the survey, that you are going to be opening your system to intrusion, at which time then you could have identity theft, you could have your... Uh, all your keystrokes clogged so they could get your passwords. They could turn on your camera. They could, uh, all kind of manner of things. So uh, you don't, really don't. Now I'm going to mention to you a way to guard against this, but I'm just giving you some examples. Here's one, Netflix. You're, oh my God, we don't want to lose our, our, our Netflix. We've got the shows on tonight. I mean, we've been waiting to see this. So we can restart the membership, click this button. Uh, Rule of thumb, don't click any of those <laughs> buttons. I don't care who you are, uh, who is sending it to you. But there are ways you can unmask exactly who is sending this, this to you. Here's one from Amazon Prime. One thing that's really interesting about all of these phishing, they're, very, they're getting to be very sophisticated. They look just like the organization that they are impersonating. They've got the, the logo. They've got some cases. They have a portion of your account number. They have who you are. They have what's going on. They have maybe your latest payment, all of this. And so 
you have to check these out. And this one you can see, I think he's pointing out something here in the address line. Uh, that doesn't really look like Amazon, okay? The first part does, but after that it does not. So the point is you really have to pay attention. Now we didn't used to have to do this. We used to be able to get on there and do our email and all that and everything's fine. That's no longer the case. No longer the case. You have to pay attention. Now, if it's an organization you don't deal with, you want to be very suspicious. If it's an organization you deal with, you want to be suspicious because if you're dealing with a reputable bank, let's say a bank, and they send you a letter that says, we need blah, 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 or check out this offer, click here. I wouldn't touch that. I don't care. I get them from, from uh, Wells Fargo all the time. I don't care who it is. You don't click on those links. If you want to go take them up on their offer, check out your payment status, see what the delivery of that package is at Nordstrom that you ordered for your granddaughter, go to the frigging place where you ordered it and check it out. Don't use these sites. Because while I can give you something, if you study it a little bit, you'll be able to mask most these out. I would say in general, you really don't. And this is what I was giving USAA Dickens about last week was, you know, here they send me a letter that says, uh, blah, 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 click here. And, you know, I'm not, I don't care who sent I'm not about to do that. And so I, I told them that they're really doing a disservice because here, you know, there's a bunch of us who are telling people, don't click on those embedded links, okay? Don't press those buttons. And here you come along and say, well, it's safe this time because we don't know if it's safe or not. Because they can get really, the criminals, really creative with those, those addresses and say, oh, this came from Amazon or this came from FedEx. And, and all it takes is one character change and it really isn't them. It goes to another site. So you have to be really, really careful. So what you need to do is look at this video. I'm not going to show it. You need this video, and this is available from thedailyscam.com. Again, this is on your pink sheet when you leave. Boop. And there's a simple six-minute video that says, here's what phishing is all about. Here's some examples of how you prevent it. And be alert. And the, they also have, this is a free site. They also have a great newsletter. keeps you up to date on what's going on. They also have a, a directory of current current uh, scams and things that are going on. So this is critical. This is absolutely critical. If you are going to stop as much as you can phishing, which is a gateway, as we've talked, for identity theft, ransomware, and all that other bad stuff. So this is where you have to go. If there's any doubt, throw it out. And then we get to the privacy and again, we come looping back to the poster child for lack of privacy. It's Mark Zuckerberg this week. It'll be someone else next week. It'll be Google's turn next week. They're, they're pulling the same game. And you understand what business they're in, right? I mean, they're not in the business of giving us anything free. We pay for it. We pay for it with our informations, with our permissions, with the cookies that they put on our devices, with our permission. Uh, and they, they monetize that information. And I, I don't even remember the latest numbers because they're so large, but Google's profits in the last year were just horrendous. I mean, the billions and billions and billions. And so that's the business they're in. They're going to exchange your information plus all the other information on that list that I gave you on all these other sites and other places that we can even get on there. And they are going to monetize that and, uh, and, and, and essentially sell it. They're selling access to it. They're not selling it. It doesn't leave their site, but the organizations can come in and use it. And so protecting the privacy is absolutely critical. And the one thing that you can do is take the time. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I love PowerPoint. This was an upgrade. Lock down your security and privacy settings. Now, uh, that sounds pretty straightforward. It's not. It's not. They make, uh, make you go through very arduous steps to do it. But it is, it is doable and is a big factor in, in protecting yourself on Facebook or any of these other sites. So once again, I will direct you to the pink sheet. Thank God for the pink sheet. 
And there is a reference there. If you Google this article, it comes from Wired Magazine. It's out there in the public domain. I didn't make it up. And it tells you in about 12 pages the simple steps to doing this. I mean, I, I just freaked out after the sixth page. But if you go all the way through, there's a video, very good three-minute video that says, okay, here's how you do it. And uh, you probably have to look at the video several times. You can do it. You have to do this if you're going to insist. Now, if you decide, well, gee, I'm just not going to be on Facebook, that's good. I mean, that's up to you. Uh, but keep in mind, if you, if you uh, discontinue your account, all of your history is still out there. And you have to go through separate steps to have that uh, erased uh, to the extent that it can be erased. And so that, that's critical because this is a, this, uh, Facebook and those other companies. I'm picking on Facebook, but these same types of things apply to any social media company and to Google and to Amazon. And I won't get into it, but who here has uh, the, uh, the Echo? Have the Echo at home? It's listening. <laughs> it's listening. I don't know how many times it just comes on in the middle of a conversation. I didn't say, I did not say her name. Anyway, so Amazon keeps a record of everything you say to the Echo, everything you order, every request you make. They keep all of that information forever for research, right? Yeah, we know what happens when they get your information. Now, Apple is coming out with, I think it's called the HomePod, one of the everything, iPod, HomePod, iPad. Um, I believe their device is coming out, their competitive device is coming out uh, soon, if it's not out, the Apple version. And they've said, we, this is bad news, we really don't think that's a good idea for, how can Amazon do that? Uh, we're only gonna do it for six months. <laughs> Oh, that was really refreshing, really refreshing. And of course, we all know once it's out there, it's always out there. So uh, anyway, I won't get into that, that the home, the whole topic of the home, and the automation of the home and the devices in the home and the security systems that are wide open and the, this device and everything are all, all vulnerabilities. But uh, that's another talk, that's another session. So it does come back, all the way back to personal security. This guy's saying, in this corner we have firewalls, encryption, antivirus software, et cetera. In this corner we have Dave, Mr. Human Error. And by and large, the largest majority, 73% last year, 73% of the successful data breaches were caused by human error. And when I say error, that means you're not taking the five steps, you're not doing anything to protect yourself. Or you're just making a mistake. So it all comes back to you. And I want to remind you that uh, this isn't a good strategy. So that's it. Thank you all very much.